The readings today is uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses uh, 8 to 15. Therefore, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. That's a heck of a passage, Ian. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, thank you that your heart is to bless and to honour everyone. And we ask for clarity and to know your heart. And for Ian, that he would know your anointing and your wisdom. And that we would hear all that you've got to say through him. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you, David, and thank you, Stuart. I think that's the first time that I've had the privilege of being introduced as the person that represents the older generation in church life. So um, we're clearly breaking new ground, and uh, I today will intend, I hope, to bring the wisdom of some of the years of learning onto one of the simplest passages to understand in the whole of the New Testament. <laughs> ha ha. Um, if you've got a notebook with you, though, you might want to jot down some notes today, or you could do it on your tablet, um, and maybe on the device that you're using to uh, look. Um, if you've been tuning in the last couple of weeks, you'll know that at the moment we're looking at the book of 1 Timothy. Uh, every year we take uh, one moment in the preaching calendar to take a book from the Bible and to go through the whole book. And we do that deliberately and intentionally because I believe this book has to be the foundation for our lives. And uh, one of the best skills we can ever learn how to do is, is learn how to mine this book and interpret it well so it becomes a living document. It becomes living truth into our lives. We know that man doesn't live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And I'm a passionate believer in the power of the Bible. And I'm a passionate believer that as a church, we need to be rooted in the word of God. And so every year we take a book from the Bible and we work our way through it. We make sure that we're not a pick and mix church that just take the bits of the Bible that are easy and straightforward, which is why we're taking a challenging scripture today and uh, looking at it and saying, actually, what does God really mean by that? And so we're deliberately working our way through 1 Timothy. Both Jody and I felt in this current season that 1 Timothy was going to be a significant uh, uh, book of the Bible for us to be working through. Just to give a bit of background and context to it, Timothy was somebody that the Apostle Paul mentored and invested his life in. Actually, Timothy is a great example of someone who uh, his mother is commended on having faith, his grandmother is commended in having faith, and they raised up a godly grandson who uh, Paul then invested his life in. And Timothy became a significant leader in the uh, kingdom of God because it was brought on by previous generations. And I want to celebrate as well having so many great youngsters in the life of Restore. It's amazing to have uh, our young people coming through in terms of the worship team today. And we honour and we celebrate the next generation. And one of the things that God has really clearly spoken to us about as a church is over this next season, more than ever, I and we need to be investing in the next generation and training them in the things of Jesus so that the, they can uh, build... Uh, on the foundation hopefully that we lay but they can build and push in and go further than we have ever a a a been able to do so in a sense Timothy is a good model of that and Paul reproducing his gifting and as I get older part of what I need to do is reproduce uh, the truths the work that God's put in into me into the next generation so that when I go to be with Jesus it's not all lost but it's passed on that's the way that we leave a good godly legacy 
So Paul sends Timothy to address some issues going on in a church. And actually the church that the letter 1 Timothy is written to is the church in Ephesus. And a couple of years ago, we worked through the book of Ephesians. A lot of people uh, like, because it's relatively easy to understand the book of Ephesians. Um, The church in Ephesus was planted by the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. It really prospered. Uh, Ephesus is one of the great cities, one of the great trading cities around the Mediterranean. The church uh, prospered and grew really really well but after a few years it hit a number of massive problems part of the problems they hit was there was a new generation of teachers who came in and they started to distort the word of God they were teaching uh, strange truths it says uh, myths and endless genealogies uh, and the apostle Paul hears of this and he sends Timothy the guy that he's mentored and he sends them to go to the church in Ephesus and to call things back into order And as a book, the whole flow of the book is about calling things that are out of order and putting them back into alignment. And we've called this whole series, we've called it Entrusted, because it's a great opportunity to rediscover what God has entrusted, what God has called the church to. And uh, you might have noticed every week that we have this key at the front. And what we're looking at as we go through each chapter of the book of uh, 1 Timothy, we're looking at some of the key truths that enable us as a church to stay on track and stay on target. And so two weeks ago, Jody did a brilliant sermon looking at how we handle the word of God. It seems like the critical problem going on in the church in Ephesus was a mishandling of the word of God. I am so passionate that we handle God's word with love and truth and sincerity. And we let the word really work through us to create the likeness of Jesus in every one of our lives. Last week, Stuart looked at the topic of prayer, and uh, we know that we're called to be a praying people because we pray in, we join with God in the work of releasing his kingdom. One of the key ways we do that is through prayer. And this week, we're looking at the role of men and women in church, or specifically on Father's Day, the role of women and the place of women in church, which is the issue that uh, is addressed in 1 Timothy chapter 2. We've called it, uh, What About Women?, now, in, um, interestingly enough, we asked Fran Sutton-Smith if she would do the reading today, and uh, she read it and then decided that she wouldn't. She'd ask David to do it. Why did she choose to do that? Not because she's a coward, not because she isn't a wonderful woman of God, but because some of the verses from 1 Timothy chapter 2 have been used to oppress and discriminate against and hold back women in the church. If that has ever happened to you, right at the very beginning, I want to apologize to you for where masculine church leadership has misinterpreted parts of the Bible and used it to keep women down. And I apologize to you, and I ask you, to forgive us, and my prayer for today is that we will become a different kind of church community, a church community that brings healing, restoration, and releases every person, irrespective of ethnic heritage, income grouping, or sex, into everything that God has for them. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, says this. This is the verse that's often been taken out of good, I think, context and misused to discriminate and hold back women in church. And it says this. It says, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. And on that basis of one verse, for hundreds of years... Women have been disqualified from being in leadership and teaching in churches in the Western world. Yet, we've sent many of them out on the mission field to teach people who don't yet believe in Jesus when we haven't entrusted them in our own loving local church community. And on the basis of that work, we've discriminated and put loads of women out into looking after our kids 
And just think about that for a minute. We've, we're very happy to use them to teach the next generation, but we've said they're not safe to teach this generation. That cannot be true. That cannot be a good representation of either the heart of God or the heart of Jesus. And we will never be that sort of church as Restore. And I want to say that really, really clearly. We will never be that kind of church. I hate misogyny. I hate sexism. And we put it under our feet and we say no to it in any and every form within the life of Restore. I hope that that's clear. So, how do we take passages of, of the scripture? Because when you read the Bible, and like I say, I love the Bible, there's some really tough um, passages in the Bible, some really difficult ones to interpret and understand, and to think, actually, what is going on in this passage, and how do we uh, line it all up together, and how do we know what the heart of God really is? Now, I think this passage is a good one to look at, because it makes us ask the bigger question. What is Paul really saying? These verses do seem to say that women shouldn't be in authority, and, and, they, and he seems to be saying women shouldn't teach. So did Paul really believe that? Is that right teaching? Or how do we understand really what the true picture are, is? And I, I want to take you through, I think, four principles. When there's a tr- difficult situation in the Bible and we don't know how to interpret it well, four things I think we should look at to get a good understanding. Number one, what's the overarching view of Scripture on this issue? Number two, what's the attitude or the teaching of Jesus on this issue? Number three, what examples can we find from the whole of the Bible? And then number four, what can we learn from the specific Bible passages that talk about this issue? Okay, so we need to look at the overarching view of Scripture because the Bible is a complete book. It's a complete story. So we can't just look at one part and take all of our theology out of it. There needs to be consistency in our whole understanding of the Bible. So in a minute, we're going to look what the Bible as a whole says about women. Secondly, we need to look at what Jesus says and how Jesus acts. Jesus said he didn't come to get rid of the Old Testament. He says he came to fulfill it. And Jesus says also, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And John writes in his gospel, Jesus is the word made flesh. So if we want to find the clearest understanding what the heart of God on a particular issue is, what we need to do is look at Jesus. And as a church and as a church teaching team, we have what theologians will call a Christological hermeneutic. I hope you're impressed and you can spell that. As a church, we have a Christological hermeneutic, which simply means the lens through which we we view the whole of Scripture is the lens of Jesus. So we look first at Jesus because he's the clearest representation of the heart of God. So difficult situation, uh, difficult teaching. What does the whole Bible say about it? Number two, what does Jesus say about it? How does Jesus act? Number three, what examples can you find around the issue in the whole of the Bible? And let's look at those. And then number four, what does this specific passage say about it? So we're going to go through those four things quickly. Uh, I, I will get you finished in good time so you'll be able to have your lunch after this, but hopefully we'll work up an appetite as we go. I'm going to look through those four things in terms of our understanding of the role of women in the Bible and therefore in the church. So in terms of the overarching view of scripture, the best place to start on any issue for understanding is Genesis, the beginning. How does God create And what does God say about the created order and authority between man and woman? Now, there's two creation stories in Genesis. Uh, Well, there's one story interpreted in two different ways. Uh, One is in Genesis chapter 1, one's in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 1, what it says is it says that God says, let us make uh, man and woman in our image. And it says that we're both made in the image of God, male and female, made in the image of God, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. You can read it fully for yourself. And it says that God gave joint authority to rule two man and woman side by side. So 
Male and female, he created them in his image. And if we want to know a full understanding, a full expression of the image of God in mankind, it's when we put a man together with a woman and they stand side by side. That's why marriage is such a wonderful picture of the heart of God. That's why uh, God honours and values the institution of marriage, because it's a representation of the fullness of his creation, the, the fullness of his image, male and female standing side by side. And it's a joint commission to jointly fill the earth and subdue or rule on the earth. In Genesis chapter 2, when there's a slightly different spin on the creation story, it says in verse 16 that God looks at the first man, who is created first, and he says it's not good for man to live on his own. And so what God does is he takes one of the ribs out of the heart of man and creates the woman who's to be loved and cherished and valued and celebrated by man so that she might stand side by side with him. There's a verse uh, in, in that uh, story that uh, says that God creates a woman to be a helper for the man. Again, that has been misused uh, often through church history. The uh, Hebrew word that's used to be a helper, creating the woman to be a helper, is 82 times referenced in the Old Testament. Never once is it used to devalue or is it used to suggest a supporting or secondary role? Every time it's used in the Old Testament, it's used with someone who has either equal authority or superior authority. There's no inferiority at all. In fact, the most common occurrence of the verse, a helper in the Old Testament, is talking about our God, who is a helper in our time of need, someone greater than us who's come up to be alongside. So again, the Genesis pattern is man and woman standing together, jointly carrying the image of God, jointly mandated to bring the authority of the rule of God here on the earth. So why don't we see that happen through human history? Where does it go wrong? Well, guess where it goes wrong? It goes wrong in the story of the fall in Genesis chapter 3. We know the story well. Man and woman meant to rule and reign together. Uh, God gives them uh, in specific instructions. They can eat of any tree in the garden except for one. And the enemy comes along like he so often does. And rather than help us to focus on the good that is available and freely there for us, he focuses on the one thing we know we shouldn't do. And the enemy comes like a snare on uh, the uh, man and the woman. He comes to the woman uh, first and he says, look at that apple. Wouldn't that be amazing if you ate that? Did God really say you can't? And the woman falls for the lies of the enemy and takes the apple and eats from it. She gives it to Adam. He ate of it as well. It was a joint sin. It wasn't just one person. It was a joint sin. And the result from that moment on is things start to go wrong. Out of their sense of guilt and shame, they hide firstly from God. Because now they feel exposed, they get clothes and they start to hide from one another. And then when God turns up, they start to indulge in the blame game and blaming one another and trying to excuse where they've fallen. And very quickly, conflict starts to come in their relationship. And actually, if you read through the whole of Genesis from that point on, you find there's a story of family after family, generation after generation, born in conflict because of the outworking of sin. And when God brings uh, judgment or confronts Adam and Eve with the consequences of their sin, in Genesis chapter 3, he says this. He says to the woman, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth, in pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And the words that he used there, the word desire is craving or longing. So to the woman, he says, your craving and your longing will be to your husband. And to Adam, to the man, he says, out of the conflict that now is born between you, you're going to try and rule and dominate your wife. And the word that is used there for rule is the word for a king exercising dominion. 
And it wasn't God's original intent, it was the result and the consequence of broken humanity and sin that led to the battle of the sexes, which is manifested in women trying to uh, entice men to do what they want them to do, and men stamping down women and making them second-class citizens. But it wasn't God's original intention. It was the result of the fall. It was the result of sin. And when we come to the New Testament and see what the New Testament says about it, and particularly when we're looking forward towards, started at the start of the Bible, when we look forward towards the end of the Bible, what does it say about the uh, men and women and their status? Well, a couple of verses just to look at. One is in Mark chapter 12, verse 25. The other is in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. In the Mark story, a number of Bible teachers come and they try and catch Jesus out when he's teaching in the temple. And the Sadducees, who don't believe in resurrection, they come to Jesus and they tell a story and they say, well, is this guy, and he was married to a woman, and they didn't have any kids, um, but the guy then died and left uh, the wife a widow. Uh, She then married the guy's brother, because that's what they used to do to raise up an heir. Um, But then he died, and they still didn't have a kid. And then she married the next one, and he died, and they still didn't have a kid. And she ended up married to seven uh, uh, people. When they get resurrected, whose wife will she be? And Jesus says, don't worry about that, because when we're we're resurrected from the dead, we'll neither be married nor given in marriage, but we'll all be angels in heaven. In other words, no distinction, no part of heaven. That's There's all the blokes where they get to reign and look fantastic. And then the other part of heaven, there's all the women running around serving the guys. It doesn't say any of that. It says, when we get to heaven, we will be one. And we will all be like angels, side by side, carrying the same image of God and the same authority. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul, who we're looking at today from what he's put in 1 Timothy, the very same Paul says in Christ Jesus, there's no Jew nor Gentile, there's no slave nor free, there's no male nor female, but we are one in Jesus. What Paul writes is in Jesus, every wall that would separate, discriminate, or put down is removed, and we are one. So it seems to be that pre the fall, we were one. Post the fall, going into, uh, or looking towards heaven, we will be one again. What should we be modelling in the church today? Surely we should not be modelling a pattern of church leadership and life that looks like the consequences of the fall in Genesis 3. Surely we should be modelling the new humanity of the kingdom of Jesus, the kingdom of the age to come, where we release and restore women back to their original design and their place of being side by side carrying the authority of God. So that's the overarching view of scripture. Secondly, what's the attitude of Jesus towards women? Well, that's really interesting because what you find is Jesus massively included women in his disciples and his bringing in of the kingdom of God. Now, some people will say, but didn't Jesus pick 12 disciples? Well, yes, he did pick 12 disciples. Why did he pick 12 male disciples? Well, the reason I think he did it is because Jesus came to fulfill the calling that in the Old Testament was given to Israel. In the Old Testament, with the calling for Israel, there were 12 tribes. And so Jesus comes to fulfill the calling on Israel. So, of course, he picks 12 men named uh, like, uh, like the 12 sons of Israel in the Old Testament. He comes with a, a creating a new kingdom that's the true fulfillment of Israel. So he picks 12 guys to do that. That doesn't mean it was exclusive, though. And what we find through Jesus is in Luke chapter 10, when he visits the home of Mary and Martha, it says of Martha that she sat at his feet, it says of Mary, sorry, that she sat at his feet listening to his word. Now, the words that use there aren't uh, the words that normally mean just to sit at the feet to serve. And remember, that's what Martha was doing. She was in the kitchen cooking the meal. 
he actually commends Mary for not serving in the background, not doing the work in the kitchen, but actually for sitting at his feet. And that phrase, sitting at the feet, is used in the Bible for a disciple who's at the feet of her rabbi, her teacher, because she's learning so she might also replicate and potentially grow into a rabbi in her own right. And Jesus commends Mary for sitting at his feet and in that act he's actually saying I'm embracing you as one of my disciples and in Luke chapter 8 the beginning of Luke chapter 8 it talks about Jesus and his disciples traveling around the towns and bringing in the kingdom of God and it talks about him taking the 12 male disciples and then it goes on and it talks about the women that were also traveling and presumably ministering with and it talks about Mary Magdalene It talks about Joanna, the wife of one of Herod's key servants, and it talks about Susanna, and it talks about them being women of means who were supporting the work of the disciples as they minister with Jesus. And so Jesus had both male and female disciples that were fully a part of his ministry and his work. If we take it on a little bit further, we've just finished a series called Living Water, where we looked at the story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Do you know, out of the whole of the gospel stories, there's only one person that Jesus had a long conversation with, that in the context of that, he fully revealed who he was to, his identity as Messiah, and that was the woman at the well. She went off then as the first missionary to win her local community to following after Jesus. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, the first person that he revealed himself to was Mary in the garden. And this is, this is, this is amazing, and we lose the cultural impact of this. Do you know in the time of Jesus, a woman's word was not allowed in a court of law to speak, to bear witness to something. And yet the first person that Jesus reveals himself to when he's risen from the dead is a woman. And then he sends that woman to go and tell all of his male disciples. She becomes an apostle to the apostles, a sent one to the sent ones to say Jesus has risen from the dead. Now, when you look at that, Jesus is massively turning the tables. You think of a a Middle Eastern country now Women so often are second-class citizens, so often marginalized from so many things. How much more was that true in the day of Jesus? And you see from stories like this, examples like this, Jesus is actually turning the tables on that and massively empowering women. And then you look through the Bible and there's a whole brace of women that God uses significantly to bring in his purposes. There's Miriam, there's Deborah, there's Priscilla, there's Phoebe, there's Junia, and there's a whole host more. But let's just look at those to begin with. Do you know in Israel history, there's many matriarchs as much as there's patriarchs. And in Jewish culture, they celebrate Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel as much as they celebrate Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. In the story of uh, Moses' birth in Exodus, in Exodus 1 and Exodus 2, the six women who take steps of faith that save the life of Moses to, so that he can be raised up to serve the purposes of God. When Micah, the prophet Micah, writes about uh, Miriam in, uh, in Micah chapter 6, he talks about the fact that God set Moses, Aaron, and Miriam before them as their leaders, the leaders of Israel. In Exodus 15, uh, Moses, after they come through the Red Sea, Moses sings a song of celebration and praise to Israel. And it says, Miriam, the prophetess, then leads all the women in dancing and celebration and also prophesies over what God is doing. Why? Because Miriam was one of the leaders in the early church in the early life of Israel. Secondly, Deborah, in the book of Judges, there's 12 judges uh, referenced through, and uh, this is uh, pre-Kings, and so the judges were the people who ruled in Israel. There's 12 judges recorded in the book of Judges. Not all of them are good, but one of the very best ones is Deborah. 
And in Judges chapter 4, when it talks about Deborah, it talks about a palm tree that was called the palm tree of Deborah. And it talks about the sons of Israel who used to come to get their rulings and their, their um, wisdom from Deborah, who God raised up to be a judge. And when she got her male uh, military commander, Barak, and said, God speaking, you need to take on the enemy, he was too frightened to go into battle unless Deborah went with them. And then as Deborah went with him, they went into a, a, a massive victory that God led them into. But Deborah was a woman that God raised up for significant authority and leadership in the kingdom of God. Come into the New Testament, you get Priscilla and Aquila. When Paul writes about Priscilla and Aquila, he talks about them being uh, some of his closest allies. And he says they risked their lives to save him. And Priscilla and Aquila are a couple, a married couple. When they're first introduced, they're introduced as, as Aquila and Priscilla. And again, note this. Okay, our tradition, normally when a couple gets married, is we put the man's name ahead of the woman's. Most people, when they refer to Chris and I, they'll refer to us as Ian and Chris. We still go by that tradition. On the whole, we tend to put the man's name first, the woman's name second. Right the way through biblical times, that would have been absolutely the norm. When Aquila and Priscilla are first introduced, they're introduced as Aquila and Priscilla because that was the culture of the day. Every other reference that Paul makes to them, he refers to them as Priscilla and Aquila, and he reverses the order. That's massively out of, con out of cultural norm. Why does he do that? Well, seemingly because Priscilla had the highest profile ministry. And she was the one they would have recognized. When he wrote, writes to them in Romans chapter 16, he, talks, he sends greetings to the church in the home of Priscilla and Aquila. In Acts chapter 18, there's a guy called Apollos who becomes uh, one of the great evangelists of the first century. He actually speaks something that isn't true and he needs correction. Who are the people who Paul sends and they, they uh, tackle him on it and bring him back into alignment? Priscilla and Aquila, a woman in major ministry that Paul, the Apostle Paul, the same one who writes 1 Timothy, commends. Carry on the list in Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16 is a list of greetings. Often we spin over that because it's the bit that doesn't seem very interesting. Actually, looking at the detail of some of this is critically important, really helpful. Romans chapter 16, the first person that Paul chooses to send greetings to, the first person in his list is Phoebe. And Phoebe is introduced in uh, Romans 16, verse 1, as a servant of the church. But you know the word that is used there for servant is the word deacon or deaconess. Next week, we're going to look at church leadership and the qualifications for church leadership. My friend Anthony Delaney from Ivy Church in Manchester is going to be speaking to us on that. Um, but we're going to look at the qualifications for leadership. The two roles we're looking for is, is uh, the elders and the deacons. Phoebe was a deacon that Paul commended in Romans 16, verse 1. And even more, this is even more radical. I love it. In Romans chapter 16, verse 7, Paul sends greetings to Ad Adronicus and Junia. Adronicus is a man. Junia is a woman. And he calls them outstanding amongst all of the apostles. Now just think about that phrase for a minute. Outstanding, all you off-dead inspectors, outstanding of all of the apostles. And one of the shocking things on this is for hundreds of years, the name Junior has been mistranslated. There's no recorded record in the time of Jesus of a male name, Junius. But some of the translators of the Bible couldn't understand why Paul would, command a, would commend a woman in that way and call her one of the outstanding of all the apostles. So they changed what in all the original scriptures, all of the original um, manuscripts is a female name, Junia. They changed it to Junius, a male name. And it's only in the last 15 years that our Bible translations have started to catch up and now they will own the fact that Paul commends Adronicus 
and Juni R, the woman, and says, outstanding amongst all of the apostles. Now, you put it in that context, boy, have we got it wrong if we've not honoured, valued, and celebrated the role of women in the life of the church. On Father's Day, the best thing that any of us can do as earthly dads and spiritual dads is to release our wives and our daughters and our wider commun church community into everything that God has called them to. Now, you're probably sitting there and saying, yeah, but Ian, we've still got to make sense of 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we have still got to make sense of 1 Timothy chapter 2. But with all of that context, and remember, a text without a context is a pretext. A text without a context is a pretext, so something that we presuppose. So we have to put everything in its context. What's the context of 1 Timothy chapter 2? Well, I said earlier, the church in Ephesus is in a great mess. It's in a huge mess because people are misusing the word of God. A new sect of teachers have come in and they're distorting the word of God. And alongside them, they've brought women who are using their wealth to manipulate and damage the work of God within the church. And so... Paul sends Timothy to bring it back into order. The first thing that he does, and Stuart uh, started to look at this last week, is he calls the men who are indulging in speculation and uh, with their teaching are bringing division and even causing some people to leave the church because of the heresies that they're coming out of. Um, what, Tim what Timothy is commissioned to say to them is to stop them teaching and to encourage them to start praying. And so uh, David read from verse 8, uh, he writes, Paul writes to Timothy, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. So what he's saying, what Paul's writing to Timothy is he's saying, tell the men to stop uh, sowing wrath and dissension. Tell them to sort out their lives. Tell them to get their uh, holiness in order and lift up holy hands and pray. And uh, Stuart looked at some of the things that were called to pray last week. He uh, commissioned them to pray for peace in the nation, to pray for leaders that there might be peace in the nation, and then to pray that all people might be saved. In other words, take your eyes off uh, looking at myths and genealogies and building a theology out of it, and let's get back to the work of bringing the kingdom of God in. Let's get rid of bitterness, let's get rid of uh, separation, let's get rid of uh, wrath and dissension, and let's go back to the real thing, which is reaching out to heaven, re lifting our hands up to heaven, and praying that God will make a way so that the kingdom of God might come here on the earth. That's what the men were called to do, and uh, Paul is writing to recommission them back into that. And then he starts to address the women and think this group of women that have come in alongside these guys, they're using church like a fashion parade. They're using their wealth to lord it over other people. Uh, one of the uh, understandings, common understanding of the church in Ephesus at this time is there was a misappropriation of finance that was going on, which is why integrity and leadership becomes an issue that is next addressed uh, uh, in uh, chapter three, which we'll look at, as I said, next week. This group of women, they were lording it over people with the way that they were dressing, with their elaborate hairstyles, with the, the gold they were putting on themselves, and they were asserting their authority through the way that they look. And so Paul writes and he says, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works. And stop and look at this for a minute. He's saying, don't worry about your outer appearance. But he's also saying, you can be part of the good works. And you can be part of the, the godly kingdom army that is being raised up in the church. So rather do that through good works and through making a claim to godly living. And I put up intentionally on the slide there, I put a picture of Jackie Pullinger. If you know Jackie Pullinger well, you know that she works with drug addicts and has done for over 50 years in, in Hong Kong. Uh, Jackie actually loves clothes and she loves looking well and she will speak about that very freely. 
But her priority is not how she lives, how she looks. Her priority is how she lives and who she includes. And what Paul is writing in 1 Timothy is he's calling the church back to making that our focus and calling the women into that. And then he goes on in, in verse 11 and he says this. He says, let a woman quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. What he's saying there is he's not saying the women can't be a part of what's happening. He's saying the women should be a part of what's happening. And earlier I talked about Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to the word. What Paul is saying is he's saying, I want women to be uh, following after the model of Mary. I want them to be sitting at the feet of the teaching so they can grow into everything that God's called them to. And again, you need to interpret it into the culture of the day. In the culture of the day, in synagogues, they would put all the men on one side and all the women on the other side. And uh, normally then, the rabbi, when he was speaking in a Jewish synagogue, is he would speak only to the men and would ignore the women. And normally, the women would just bring whatever they wanted to to the synagogue and the meetings because all that was addressed was the men. I'm looking to that side, I'm looking to David Ward, um, not because all the men are on this side and all the women on this side in the studio, in case you're worried, but what a rabbi would do is he would only address the men and he would ignore the women. And so the women normally would just chatter to one another and do their own thing because nobody was paying them attention. And Paul writes and he says, no, let a woman receive submission. Let her listen to the teaching. And it's not, a, it's not a don't let the women participate. It's actually bring the women into the meeting because I want them to learn as well. And then he goes on and we get this passage about Adam and, and Eve and the created order and that, that sort of thing. Do you know, this is so misinterpreted. So I want to do, so I want to put some of this right. In uh, verse 12, it says this. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. What does Paul mean by that? What he means is I want a woman to learn before she then teaches, as everyone ought to. And the word that's used there when it says, I do not allow a woman to exercise authority over a man, it's the only time in the New Testament that this one word is ever used for authority. It's not the standard word for authority. It's not the usual word for exercising authority in any area of life. It's not the usual word for elders exercising authority. It's a different word. And as I say, it's only used this one time in the whole of the New Testament. In adjacent literature from the time, the word that is used is a word that actually has connotations of violence in the way authority is used. And it's most commonly interpreted for domineering or abusive leadership. And so what Paul is saying to this group of women who are trying to usurp in power and uh, display everything they think God's called them to, he's saying, actually, you're being abusive and you shouldn't lead in that way because that's not godly leadership. But it's not the usual word that is used for someone exercising godly leadership. So he's saying to the women, don't be domineering. In as much as he would have tackled the men if they were being domineering. And he goes back to the Adam and Eve story, not to say Adam was created before Eve, therefore he has authority over her. Because if that was true, the animals were created before Adam, who were created before Eve. And by the same logic, the animals would have authority over us. Not that. What he's saying is there was an order put in creation. There was an order put in creation so you could partner with one another. And he's calling a group of domineering people back into line. And he's saying, you've got ahead of yourself. You need to learn because if you learn, then you'll become safe teachers. And he uses a story where Eve was deceived. Why was Eve deceived? Because she didn't have a fully full grip on the word of God. And he's saying to this New culture, this new group of folk, I want you to have a full grip on the word of God. And then it finishes off with a strange verse that talks about uh, uh, women being saved through childbirth. Actually, that isn't what he's talking about, because at the time, the goddess Artemis was worshipped in Ephesus. She was the goddess of fertility. People used to believe through the worship of Artemis, they got to have their salvation. 
And Paul calls them back to being women who in faithfulness and a reverence and a godly lifestyle in Jesus find their way to salvation. You see, a good understanding of what the Apostle Paul teaches says women are valued, they're loved, they're created in the image of God. They need to be invested in, they need to be nurtured, they need to be empowered so they can be released to bring in the kingdom of God. What do we believe about women in the life of the church? We believe this. If you can put up the next slide. We believe this. Next slide. (laughs) That one. We believe God has anointed women to carry the kingdom of God and to fully play their part to see the kingdom of God come on earth as it is in heaven. If the band want to come back, I just want to say a couple of things. I know I've spoken for quite a long time. It's a big issue, though, and I think it's important that you know that what we believe is backed up by a good understanding of Scripture. Over the last year, I've had to think hard about what the real things that I believe are and the real things that I believe we're called to as church and as Restore. I believe a few things for me have come to the fore as absolute non-negotiables that I know that God's called us to. One is we're called to be good news to our community. Number one, teaching of Jesus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Number two, love your neighbour as yourself. As a church, we have to be about, that's why those good news stories that Stuart shared are so good. We have to be about loving our community, serving our community. We have to be about the the Great Commission, the last uh, commission that Jesus gave to us. We have to be about reaching the world for him. We have to be about truly inclusive community. One of the good things about not being able to gather on a Sunday is we've had to become community for one another in other ways. Let's not lose that. We're meant to be an inclusive, all-embracive community. There's some other things that have come to the fore for me, though. We are called to be a church for the nations and of the nations. As Restore, we will not tolerate any racist attitudes or any discrimination on the basis of ethnicity. I'm really pleased that God is sending Tobias and Joyce Engala to be part of the senior leadership of Restore from Kenya because he's called us to be a church of the nations and for the nations. And I am determined that we will have no discrimination on the base of racism or ethnicity, but we will embrace and celebrate God's creation and God's image and God's original design in every nation and ethnicity. Number two, integrity and leadership really matters. I'd encourage you to tune in next week. Uh, My good friend, Anthony Delaney, Um, He leads uh, an organisation called New Thing in Europe. Uh, We've joined uh, New Thing, a fellowship of like-minded churches. And uh, you'll be able to hear a bit more about that next week and uh, listen to Anthony. Um, I don't know if uh, if you pay much attention to the headlines. This week, another spat between Matt Hancock, Dominic Cummings and Boris Johnson, where they say to one another, you're telling lies and we don't trust you. We as the public, we look at them and we say, we don't trust you either. The reason we don't trust them is because we bought into a lie that how we live in our private life doesn't affect how we live in our public life. Of course it does. It's called integrity. And for leadership, there has to be moral standards and character standards that we have to live by. Anthony is going to talk about that next week on the basis of 1 Timothy chapter 3. Primary qualification for leadership is character, not gifting, character, godly character, Christ-likeness. We will never put anyone into leadership in the life of Restore if they do not have a character and a commitment to look like Jesus. And if anything comes to light that suggests otherwise, 
and they're not prepared to own it or deal with it, they will not be able to stay in leadership. Because character and integrity is so important because it replicates the heart and the nature of Jesus, but it also creates a godly, God-honoring foundation that then produces safe spiritual leaders, fathers and mothers that can take care of the church. And thirdly, as a church, we will not tolerate sexism or misogyny, but we will seek to see the beauty and the image of God in every person, male or female, or whatever else. And we will seek to love that out and release every person into all that God has called them to be. We're going to worship in a moment, but I just want to take us a moment just to pray. As we stand in these moments, I just want to apologize to you. If ever your experience in Restore has been less than it should have been in terms of issues over race, sexism, or integrity and leadership, I want to say sorry. I want to ask that you'll forgive us and that even more importantly, you might receive the forgiveness and the cleansing and the healing of Jesus. And I want to speak specifically to our women. And I want to say we see you we honour you, we celebrate you, and we release you into everything that God has called you to. And as a leader in Christ's body, I want to repent of any time, either in your recent history or your pre-restore history, where you've received any other message other than one that celebrated who you are, honoured who you are, and sought to release who you are. I want to repent on behalf of every male leader for whatever reason who was put down or limited or restricted or disempowered women. And I ask God that you'll forgive us as men, church leaders, fathers, spiritual fathers, where we've got it wrong. And I pray right now that you'll bring healing, cleansing, and restoration. And Lord, as we're praying for a releasing of the next generation, Father, I pray for a rising up and a releasing of women in the life of the church to know they are made in the image of God, that they're equally valued, equally loved, uniquely valued, uniquely loved by their heavenly Father, by their church community. And we bless you and we honour you and we release you into all that God's called you to. If you're a woman reaching out to God, continue to reach out to God. Let the Holy Spirit work this morning. I believe the Holy Spirit does want to do some significant work of healing. Let the Holy Spirit work and uh, hear words of commendation, love and celebration over you release and empowerment over you right now. We have a prayer team on hand online. There's a request prayer button. If you'd like someone to pray for you, click that button and someone will pray with you, stand alongside you, honour and celebrate you, facilitate the work of healing in your life. I'm going to invite the worship team to take us on in worship, but 
let's let the Holy Spirit continue to work and release God's best for all of us as we worship him.